and welcome to another episode of Dying to Meet You. And today we have someone who flew all the way across the border uh, from KL to be sitting here with us. Yes, uh, thank you for doing this special edition, you know, all the way from Malaysia. <laughs> You, you awesome. flew here for me, right? Because you were dying of course, to meet right? I'm dying to meet you. <laughs> yes, exactly. Death has always been a certainty. That's what I like about Anjali. It has to be a certainty. Endless topics that we can talk about. Dying to meet you. Welcome to my podcast. So I started my first business at the age of 14. 14? Yeah, yeah. But not by choice. Okay. So my parents got divorced at an early age. When I was an early age, right? At the age of 12. And life changed for me. Mm. Um, and I had to help my mom out, right? So at the age of 14. Uh, so she started baking mm. and something that she loved to do. Um, it was me and my sister. So she couldn't, she couldn't really go and find a job or anything, right? She hadn't, she hadn't worked for more she than... She was like uh, a housewife. Yeah, she was a housewife for, for the longest time that I knew her, right? Mm. So I became her number one uh, salesman <laughs> at the age of 14. Uh, oh, well, I was her only salesman, <laughs> so it wasn't difficult. <laughs> and you come free of charge, so... Yeah, man. Yeah, correct. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so I learned a lot uh, mm. from that first kind of a business. Mm. I learned how to value add. I learned how to pick a target market. Wow. I learned how to, you know, uh, find a niche for my sales, self-sales. And my niche at the age of 14 was, I call it the, the pity technique. La. Please la, buy, la. I'm 14 years old, la. don't, la. please buy, please. Yeah. I, I did not get along well with my dad. Oh. Yeah. He, at, when I was very young, I will always remember him as this very hot-tempered, mm. um, angry person. Right? And I, I, whenever I had conversations with him, he would always end up with, with uh, me crying or him uh, shouting mm. or uh, me getting the cane or something like that, right? So it was a very difficult experience to go through. So I remember when I was going through that period, when I was between 11 to, or rather 12 to 14, I had a lot of mixed feelings. Uh, one part of me was feeling uh, lost or confused. Another part of was, me was feeling happy. Mm. And I was actually happy that uh, I didn't have to see him again. Mm. Right? So it was a, a lot of mixed feelings. Yeah. yeah. What would you describe your relationship with him now? Now, mm. now we don't have the best of relationship, but we see each other uh, every Chinese New Year. Mm. Um, I go and visit him. Uh, he's remarried now. Uh, so I visit him every Chinese New Year and every birthday, I will call mm. him out for a, for a meal. And I realized one thing, right? Um, after that period, when I went to college, um, he would visit me when I was in London. He was a pilot, right? So he yeah. would go to London pretty often. And he was a completely different person oh. than how I remembered him when he was a, I, was a, I was a child. He became this, one of the nicest people I know, mm. right? Um, and just became like, almost like a buddy, right? And, and I was, at, at first I was very apprehensive, right? I'm like, it was going on, <laughs> right? But then I started asking myself, right? What, what happened? Yeah. How come, right? And I realized that, you know, after going through my own relationships in the years and so on, I realized that perhaps he was that way because he was just unhappy. Mm. He was p perhaps unhappy in a relationship or unhappy with that. Yeah. My mom is the nicest person in the world, right? Everyone comments that and I, I know for that for a fact. Yeah. So when I was growing up, I always felt like a bit of a disappointment. Like, how can you not love this woman, which is like the nicest person in the world? Mm. But I think I realized that at the end of the day, you know, two people just need to align and this needs to click. Yeah. The chemistry must be there. And the, the, the what would you call that? Chemistry and um, com the uh, compatibility. <laughs> Thanks, <you see. laughs> the compat must be too many drinks. Yeah. <laughs> chemistry and the compatibility must be there. Mm. So even, and chemistry alone just doesn't cut it, right? Because mm. it will get you in the door, but it will not last. Sustain, yeah. right? So oh. two people can be the nicest people on earth, but they, if they don't have the compatibility, yeah. it may cause an unhappy relationship. No, and that's probably sure. what happened. Yeah. When they were both out of the relationship. They're both happier. They're both happier. My dad is this, <laughs> this happy person in life. Yeah. You know, he's like almost 80 now and mm. he's still climbing mountains. Oh, and wow. he's a, he's a, he's I, I got that from him, like the genes yeah. of, of sportsmanship, right? Mm. And yeah, so I think, you know, yeah, I, I find like divorce is always 
um, I mean, again, you know, now that this day and age, uh, people, when they get into a relationship, if things doesn't work out, they get a divorce. And I always say that I'd rather people be happily separated than to be miserable together, mm. right? Yeah, and, and I think if separation can make both happy and not affect the kids. In 2007, about 2007, we had competitors. Mm. And actually, these, were, these competitors were trained by me. Oh, right. Because I was doing a lot of talks, yeah, and yeah. then uh, teaching people what we do and mm. this and that. Right, being very arrogant, mm. right, saying, "Ah, oh, you know, this is how we how we do things and this and that." So then, as more competitors came, um, I remember a conversation that I had back in two thousand and seven ish, and uh, my salesperson came up to me and says, "Boss, um, remember this deal, this customer that we've been doing business for the last four years." Okay. Um, there is another com Company. competitor which is bidding against us now. So I said, show me. So I looked at the name. Oh, okay, this guy is the one I trained. Right? Don't worry. Mm. Right? So I actually said this to my salesperson. I said, don't worry. I said, don't worry because we are four to five years ahead of anybody else in the industry. industry yeah. Yeah. Right? Our customers will it's know lawyer. who to choose. Uh -huh. And I said, our customers will know who to choose. <gasps> right? And... And if you are, if you're an apple and apple, yeah. how would you choose an apple, yeah. right? Obviously the cheaper apple, mm. because it looks the same. Mm. And I was so arrogant, I didn't realize that. So more and more, we started to lose deals. Mm. And in 2007, I was such on a high, I started to employ more people than I need to anticipate that business. I would get more business. So I would train and anticipate more people. But then that didn't happen. More and more people, uh, start, more, we, more and more we lost, lost customers um, and then I got into a bit of debt mm. and I was still arrogant and more debt and more debt and at one point in 2009 I was owing the bank about a million plus dollars oh I God. was uh, owing suppliers another million dollars my phone until today my phone is in, cons in a perpetual silent mode because you scared because I have this you? trauma <laughs> of calls. Oh, because wow. at that time, every call would be uh, somebody asking for money. Mm. It's either the bank or supplier asking, when are you going to pay me? Mm. So I'll just silent my phone perpetually. And I didn't know how to get out of it. Um, and one, and it was one day that, um, so over here, you guys call it CPF. Right? Yeah, EPF, right? EPF Malaysia. in Malaysia, right? So, um, we had we had just zero cash to to to, to pay even the, the CPF, right? So I held the CPF payments. Mm -hmm. Right? So I said, okay, okay, I'll pay it next month, right? And unfortunately one of my staff found out. So then I, I tried to explain, right? Says no no no. It's not that we are not gonna pay, we're not cheating you of your money. It's just that we we just need a month. Mm. Right? Unfortunately, it's already done, right? And, and we did a bad thing. So they didn't, they didn't take it lightly. Mm. So a couple of them started leaving. I went from 26 people down to four people in five months. Wow. Right. Um, and that was in 2009. That was also a time which, uh, my, my father-in-law passed away. Mm. Right. My father-in-law passed away from cancer. Oh, sorry. It was just three months. Right. Wow. And he just left us in three months. And the reason why that was so significant was because in the story that I told you earlier about me and my dad mm. having a very uh, strange uh, relationship, my father-in-law was this father People. that I had always imagined mm. that I had. So he treated me really well and I got mm. along with him. So when he got cancer and he passed away in three months, it, it affected me, it affected the whole family. Mm. Right? So with that, uh, and then I, I argued so much with my, my, my wife because mm. was, I was just in so much of a, torment right, right? Yeah. from every different angle i remember i was sitting in my car one day um and i was just i didn't know what to do and i actually told my, i actually played this scene in my head of a movie which you know if you turn on your engine and you leave your and you aircon, up, aircon and you <laughs> wind up all the windows uh -huh. and you just yeah die sense, la, yeah right so i actually contemplated uh Wow. committing suicide and i thought that was the only way i could get out of the situation Oof. Yeah. what was the moment that changed ah. so when i was in that i was i was in tears i was crying and i didn't want to go home because mm. i didn't want to go back into the house right um and 
explain yet another time that mm. I was going through things, right? For some reason, right, um, this guy I know, he wasn't my best friend, but he was one of the people that knew what I was going through. Uh, he called me. I looked at the phone and says, I really don't want to speak to anybody now. He called me again for some reason, right? So for some reason, I felt this inclination to pick up his phone. So I picked up his phone call and I started talking to him. He asked me, how am I? Things like that, right? What am I doing? Right? And after about 10 minutes, right? <clears throat> he asked me his question. He says, Raymond, can I ask you something? I said, what? Can I ask you what are you grateful about? So I says, how, how can you ask me? In this time, I'm describing to you my situation. How miserable you are. Yeah, and uh, all that. I, I know, how, what am I grateful about? Yeah. I'm grateful about nothing. Right? Everything is collapsing in my life. I'm grateful for nothing. Then he continued to ask me again. No, no, no. There must be something. He asked me again. And I scolded him again. And he asked me again. He asked me about like four to five times. Hmm. And finally, I just got so fed up, right? I says that, okay, 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 right? If, if, you need if I answer to... you, like something, like, right? You would just shut up. La. Okay, I just need you to shut up. La. So he says, sure. So then I, I answered, I said, okay, la, I, I'm grateful that I have you to talk to. La. Oh. Right? And for some weird reason, everything started to change. I know it sounds very cliche, mm. but maybe you have to be in that moment to realize. And he said, thank you. Right? Um, then, then I says, then, then he says, okay, maybe it's time for you to go home now. So then I went home. Then the next morning, he called me again. <laughs> asked me the same stupid question. No? <laughs> right? And he called me every single day for the next five days, asking me the same exact question. question. What are you grateful for? And every day I answered him. Mm. And that was in 2009. Mm. Since 2009 to today, I've never stopped asking myself, what am I grateful for? every single morning. Oh, wow. I understand now uh, that sometimes we all want our day to be of a certain way. Mm -hmm. But really how our day will be is how we start it. Mm. You know, people are always saying that, oh, you've got to be positive. Start your day in a positive note, right? But how do you how? become yeah. positive, right? You can't become positive. You have to be positive. Mm. So I think the minute I told myself, what am I grateful for? The way that I was, my, you know, the, how people say laws of attraction, right? You, you are, you attract who you are, right? Mm -hmm. So the minute I was grateful, my whole energy changed. Okay. And the minute my energy changed, I started to think a lot more creatively. Mm. So after that week, right? I started to think, hey, actually, yeah, if I just keep on ignoring my suppliers and I don't pay my suppliers, right? <gasps> I will continue to suffer and they will also suffer and if they suffer, they'll make me suffer even more. Uh -huh. Why don't I just call them and I just give them a, a deal? Yeah. And I, I thought that they wouldn't do a deal. I thought they would just be very angry at me. Mm. So I picked up the courage and I called my suppliers and said, hey, you know what? Look, obviously you know I'm ignoring your calls. So obviously if you keep calling me, I'm not going to pay you but because I can't, can you do me a favor? Right? I can't pay you at all. But if you give me 12 months, um, I'll pay you this amount every month. And, and I'll pay you an additional 2% to 3% mm. every time I pay you. Wow. So in the end, you will get more. Mm. But it helps me in my cash flow. Mm. And you will get paid. Right? And majority of them says, okay. Yeah. Right? Exactly. So that creativeness came when my energy was different. Mm. So, so that and then the rest of the stuff is just more of negotiating. Yep. How I bounced back was just negotiating mm -hmm. and just finding a win-win situation out of everything. True. Right? I didn't need to win in everything, but I needed to make sure that both of us won. And the business lesson is what works today is not going to work tomorrow. tomorrow yes. And we must always be in this constant ask of ourselves. Absolutely. What do I need to do differently today? Mm. Even though our business is at a high, we have to constantly ask, what do I need to do differently? Yep. We always must change because everyone is changing. Correct. I, I've always been asking myself, right? What will people say about me at my funeral? Hmm. So I was always imagining this scene, right? Of me looking at the whole funeral, right? Me, 
my dead body there and people were just talking about me. <laughs> and just looking and I'm just at eavesdropping. <laughs> what are you saying about me? What, what, what better are you saying about me, right? <laughs> and then... And, and I, I guess in a way, I wanted to... I wanted to create this impact. Yeah. Right? Um, so I'm not looking for like a party... I'm not looking for... Your you know, display of your whiskeys, no? <laughs> in, no. No, so huh? I, 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 really, I really just want... If there's anything, right? Uh-huh. Um, uh, if there's anything I would like to know, right? If there's one thing I would, I would dream about, about happening, right? Is that when I die, the people that have probably uh, been impacted in any way mm. with regards to any of my business teaching or anything mm. would come together and just write a book perhaps together oh, wow. a, and share stories of how what the journeys that they've gone through and put it and collectively in the book so that mm. those stories can impact others. La. Exactly. It's like the tools of the Titan, right? Mm. But it's like your end of your work but not done by you work. Yeah. You know? Wow, that's beautiful. Yeah. There's a book uh, called The Trillion Dollar Coach. Trillion Dollar Coach. If you've okay. not watched, if you've not read it, right? Uh-huh. It's a book written by all the top CEOs uh-huh. uh, in like the CEO of Google, mm. uh, the CEO of uh, all the top CEOs okay. um, of their coach. Oh. And he was never a book writer and he would never ever write a book. Interesting. But they all became top companies in because the world. Of- bec- and one of the things they attributed was because of him. He was the coach. So after he died, they all came together to write that <gasps> book. And it's one of my favorite books. Oh my God, I'm going to read it. So yeah. do you have a title for your book? I don't. <laughs> When you I'm think about it, let me, will, let, me, let me know, okay? <laughs> and then I'll, I'll be in charge when I'm still around. Like, if I'm still around, you know, um, to, to ask oh. all your mentee, oh like, okay, gosh. everybody, we need to get yeah. together. Yeah. <laughs> my book will probably be called Sucker for Torture. <laughs> Sucker for Torture, I like that. <laughs> Sucker for Torture. <laughs> the death has always been a certainty. That's what I like about Anjali. It has to be a celebration. Endless topics that we can talk about. Dying to meet you. Welcome to my podcast.